the disinfecting team is in action. They're cleaning an entire apartment block in Hong Kong. It's where the latest coronavirus victim in the city took ill. So all 16 floors of the block have to be sterilized. emergency. The new case confirmed in Boston and word now that the Department of Defense will be providing quarantine facilities if needed. The coronavirus death toll rising. This as there are now more than 12,000 cases confirmed worldwide. The Trump administration declaring a public health emergency. All this expected to have a major effect on businesses worldwide. Apple announcing today it is closing all of its stores and corporate offices in China. And beginning tomorrow, U.S. citizens who have traveled to the affected region in the last 14 days will be subject to mandatory quarantines. Meet the virus hunters, a team of Thai scientists who identify emerging diseases. But since January, they've had one mission to help the government detect the new coronavirus. They've already cut the results waiting time down from almost two days to just three hours. The early detection and the uh, fast uh, reporting the result not, uh, not just good only for the, the patient, it's, it's good also good for the government. So if this is positive, they can find the other contacts to not uh, make the, the disease spread. 1,500 specimens have already been analyzed here. That includes repeat screening of patients and any of their possible contacts. First, the virus is killed and the DNA is extracted. That's then separated into containers so it can be tested to prove if it's coronavirus or not. Nearly 200 Americans on this flight already quarantined tonight in Riverside, California. Tonight, the latest battle to contain the coronavirus being fought in Massachusetts. It seems to be an isolated incident, an isolated case. Uh, we're going to be making sure I'm monitoring it all day long. The patient, a student at UMass Boston who traveled to Wuhan, China, arriving at Logan Airport January 29th. He's now at home in isolation. The latest case bringing the confirmed number of people infected with coronavirus in the U.S. to eight across five states. Tonight, New York announcing it is one of 37 states looking into possible still unconfirmed cases. U.S. officials declaring a public health emergency. It is likely that we will continue to see more cases in the United States in the coming days and weeks, including some limited person-to-person -person transmission. Starting tomorrow, any foreign national who traveled to China in the last 14 days will be banned from setting foot on U.S. soil. They check everybody's temperature and make sure you're not having fever. Tonight, the U.S. military says if needed, it is ready to provide quarantine housing for up to 1,000 evacuees at bases in Colorado, California, and Texas. 195 Americans flown out of Wuhan this week will spend at least two weeks quarantined on a military base east of Los Angeles, closely watched for symptoms. Just kind of making the best of it while we're out here and trying to keep a uh, you know positive attitude. The ripple effects of the virus now infecting the economy with markets plunging and companies like Apple, Starbucks for now closing their doors in China and United, American and Delta Airlines canceling all China flights. But despite nearly 260 reported deaths in China, there are no fatalities in the U.S. And health experts say the risk to the general public is low. Four new cases of the disease, including two healthcare workers who tested positive for the virus, and a medical center in Brighton on the south coast of England is now closed. Overall, there are eight confirmed cases in the U.K. For more on this, let's speak to Dr. Richard Darwood. He is a specialist in travel medicine, joins us live via Skype. First of all, what does this declaration from the health department mean? Well, we're now entering uh, uncharted territory because it's actually a very, very long time since quarantine laws have been invoked in this country. Um, but basically the new uh, escalation of the level of public health threat that has been declared gives the uh, public health authorities the right to legally detain uh, people in order to prevent the spread of disease. When you say it's been a while, how unusual is this, particularly within the region? Are there other countries in Europe implementing these measures? 
Uh, I'm not quite sure what's going on in other countries, but the last time we had quarantine legislation enforced in uh, in uh, in, the, in the UK, in the mainland UK, you've got to go back as far as the uh, plague outbreaks of the 1600s to find uh, actual quarantine being enforced. There was a village that uh, famously quarantined itself in 1665. Um, there's legislation that dates to the 1700s as a result, but it was never used. Definitely, and go and and makes into our community to dis to like spread their virus. So a city which has been protesting for months for more democratic rights is protesting again. This time for protection from the virus. And there are more problems ahead with thousands of medical staff signing up to join a union and voting to strike from Monday if all the border crossings with the mainland are not shut down. The pressure is building to completely isolate China. Facebook is taking an Israeli cyber surveillance rather firm to court next week for allegedly hacking users of its encrypted messaging service, WhatsApp. The social media giant accused NSO group of hacking into the phones of nearly 1,400 users back in October. Among them were human rights activists, political dissidents and journalists. NSO Group disputed those allegations, promising to fight them vigorously. Amazon chief executive Jeff Bezos has previously said NSO could have provided the software that Saudi Arabia used to hack his phone. There are several instances where NSO has been caught out. The FBI is reportedly investigating the firm over the way its software has been linked to hacks into dissidents, particularly cases in Saudi Arabia. In 2018, researchers in Canada identified 36 operators that they said were using NSO technology on targets in 45 countries, including on Omar Abdulaziz, a Saudi critic. Abdulaziz later alleged in a lawsuit the same software was used to target dissident Jamal Khashoggi, who was murdered by Saudi agents in 2018. It's hard to think of an ideal more American than the freedom of speech. When people say our soldiers fight and die for our values, what they mean is our freedom to say what we think is true. That's our birthright. It's the most important thing we have, that we have ever had. And so for generations, there was bipartisan consensus about this. In fact, liberals were among the most stalwart defenders of the First Amendment and good for them. But then the left took control of this country's institutions. Liberals became the establishment they had once opposed. And suddenly, free speech seemed like a challenge to the highly profitable existing order the one they were getting so rich from. So our schools began to teach our children that freedom of speech is a threat. In fact, it's immoral. And over time, the kids started to believe it. Why wouldn't they? At this point, nearly 60% of young people believe we should change the First Amendment to ban speech they don't like. Now, changing amendments is hard. Two thirds of Congress would have to approve a change like that. But on campuses, many students aren't waiting for Congress to act. They've decided to impose censorship right now. Watch, for example, kids at the purportedly impressive Northwestern University try to ban Jeff Sessions from speaking out loud. responsibility does Facebook, does Twitter bear here? Well, I think we're seeing that the election in particular has highlighted and amplified how impactful social media is having, whether it's Twitter or Facebook. And so I think all of these private organizations, and we have to emphasize that these are private organizations, they aren't subject to First Amendment coverage, they're not subject to common carrier rules, but how they, how they think about their impact requires them to reflect on what that looks like, even if it's a small percentage of that today, how that will change over time and what kind of tools that they can use to, to on a non-arbitrary basis, um, manage um, fake news or harassment or um, aggression through their sites is something that they need to be taking a look at and I suspect they should Royce have. only built expensive cars and jet engines, think again. The company is now jumping into the nuclear power industry. Rolls Royce is perhaps best known for its swanky cars and as a symbol of the lifestyle of the rich and famous, but the company also builds jet engines and is now jumping in on the nuclear energy sector. 
Rolls-Royce has plans to install what are called SMRs, or small modular reactors, in the United Kingdom to replace decommissioned reactors. The UK has 15 nuclear reactors now, but half will be retired by the year 2025. SMRs are so small, they can be assembled in factories and transported by truck, train, even barge. Rolls-Royce is planning to put into operation 10 to 15 of these so-called mini-reactors by 2029. They're about 1 16th the size of major stations and can fit into a much smaller area. Rolls-Royce says it's all about intelligent power. Writing on its website, Our world needs more low-carbon power than ever, so we're leading a UK consortium to develop an affordable power plant that generates electricity using a small modular reactor, an intelligent way to meet our future needs. But critics of nuclear power say the UK should continue to add more renewable power capacity instead of nuclear energy. And there's a similar battle underway here in the United States over the future use of these mini reactors. The U.S. Department of Energy describes advanced SMRs as, quote, a key part of the department's goal to develop safe, clean, and affordable nuclear power options. Not everyone is convinced. The nuclear watchdog group Beyond Nuclear describes SMRs as a type of nuclear fission reactor, generally between 10 megawatts and 300 megawatts in size, far smaller than a conventional light water reactor. They're intended to be manufactured on a factory-style assembly line in order to reduce on-site construction time. And that raises concerns about the reliability of such small nuclear reactors and the potential for radioactive leaks because of design flaws due to production line mistakes, along with the other environmental and public safety dangers and concerns. Kevin Camps, Beyond Nuclear's radioactive waste watchdog, told me, SMRs are less cost effective than current large scale reactors. Not only does it cost more per unit electricity produced to generate electricity with SMRs, but they use more water for cooling and generate more radioactive waste per kilowatt hour of electricity generated than current large scale atomic reactors. There are no SMRs currently operational in the United States, but the Department of Energy has a plan underway in the state of Idaho to change that. It's being called the nation's first small modular reactor plant, and according to the DOE, quote, will consist of 12 independent new scale small modular reactors in a shared pool, generating 60 megawatts of electricity each, constructed off-site and shipped to the Idaho National Laboratory site located in the desert west of Idaho Falls to build sometime in the mid-2020s. Nuclear watchdog groups like Beyond Nuclear are concerned about the U.S. Nuclear Regulation Commission rolling back safety regulations to accommodate SMR development, such as the Idaho National Laboratory Plan, and thus raising concerns about emergency planning and evacuation requirements taking a back seat in the approval process.